Hello, and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. Coming up in today's newscast, the Netherlands and Israel collaborate to improve the Palestinian economy. A new train promises to cut down travel time between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, and an ancient discovery gives us an idea of what the second temple actually looked like. I'm Natasha Kirchak here with the latest news in Israel. The Israeli Prime Minister set out to the Netherlands yesterday where he met with his Dutch counterpart Mark Rutte. As per usual, the Israeli-Palestinian peace talks were at the top of the agenda, but this time the needs of Gazan civilians were made priority. The Netherlands has now agreed to help Israel boost energy and water supplies to the Gaza Strip. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says that Israel wants to help the population in Gaza and that his cabinet has already made a decision to lay a gas pipeline from Israel to the coastal enclave. Today we uh, discuss a number of important steps to that end. First, improving the supply of energy and water to Gaza. We have no battle, no qualms with the people of Gaza, only with the band of terrorist thugs who have taken them blackmail. So we fight the terrorists. But we want to help the population. And the first step is to improve the supply of energy and water to Gaza, including laying a gas pipeline. Dutch leader Root says his country has already invested in a feasibility study for laying a gas pipeline in the region and will facilitate meetings between Dutch, Israeli and Palestinian officials that focus on energy and water. The Gaza Strip remains severely impoverished under the rule of the terror organization Hamas. Israel continues to maintain a naval blockade on the coastal enclave to prevent Hamas from smuggling in weapons and materials that could be used to attack Israel. But the Jewish state wants to find a way to help civilians who have been severely impacted by years of conflict between Hamas and Israel. Israeli leaders want to improve the Palestinian economy to provide a more fertile ground for political negotiations. And Prime Minister Netanyahu is happy that the Netherlands is on board. You asked, are we ready to do it? I'm telling you here, today, we have made a decision in our cabinet to do it. And I appreciate your help in realizing this project. As per usual, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says he's ready to meet with the Palestinian president for peace talks, especially since Russian leader Vladimir Putin has offered to hold a joint meeting in Moscow. Yet Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas says no meeting has been planned in Russia. Meeting or no meeting, the Israeli leader has made it clear that he's ready to meet Abbas as long as there are no preconditions to their negotiations. אני מוכן להיפגש עם אבו מאזן בכל עת ללא תנאים מוקדמים, לשיחות ישירות. זה דבר שאני אמרתי אותו מאות פעמים ואני חוזר ואומר את זה כאן. אני לא בררני לגבי המקום, אם זה פה בהולנד או במוסקבה או בכל מקום אחר, אין בעיה וזה בהחלט יכול להיות במוסקבה. אמרתי את זה לנשיא פוטין, אמרתי את זה לשליח בוגדנוב רק אתמול. Yet Palestinian President Abbas says no meeting has been planned in Moscow, claiming Netanyahu has postponed any plans. يتم فيه الاتفاق على موعد لأنه يهمني جدا هذا الحوار بيننا وبين الإسرائيلي سواء كان في موسكو أو في أي مكان آخر لأن الحوار هو الطريق الوحيد للوصول إلى سلام لإقامة دولة فلسطين إلى جانب دولة إسرائيل لتعيش جنبا إلى جنب أمن واستقرار the Israeli Prime Minister claims Abbas's offers to meet are useless if he continues to be unclear about whether or not he'll drop preconditions to peace negotiations. שהם מוכנים להיפגש, אבל יש להם תנאים. שחרור אסירים, הם רוצים לדעת כבר מה יהיו תוצאות השיחות וכדומה. 
אם אבו מאזן מוכן להיפגש ללא תנאים מוקדמים, לשיחות ישירות, אני מוכן בכל עת. להפך, אני קורא לו לעשות זאת כבר קרוב לשבע שנים, ואם הוא יסכים לעשות זאת, תהיה פגישה. Abbas is attempting to argue that Israel's fight against the Palestinian preconditions are insulting to international efforts to solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, despite recent Israeli efforts to improve the Palestinian economy. ولا يفوتنا أن نشيد بدعم الاتحاد الأوروبي السياسي والاقتصاد وبخاصة في دعم جهودنا لبناء مؤسسات دولتنا المستقلة وبناها التحتية But the Israeli government's actions suggest Abbas's accusations are unfounded. Prime Minister Netanyahu is currently in the Netherlands where he's agreed to collaborate with Dutch leaders to boost the Palestinian economy in the Gaza Strip by building a gas pipeline from the Jewish state into the coastal enclave. Despite the new plans, for now it's unclear if the Israeli Prime Minister and Palestinian President will work out their differences and make it to a meeting in Moscow on September 9th. American Jews will overwhelmingly support Hillary Clinton over Donald Trump in the race for the U.S. presidency. That's at least a view of political science professor Shmuel Sandler, who told ILTV Steve Leibowitz that Trump has made few friends in the Jewish community and is viewed as untrustworthy. Dr. Sandler, I want to take a look now at the Jewish vote, which is a very important vote, in, certainly in, in a number yeah. of the swing states. Is normally the Democrats get a majority. They always get a majority. Sometimes it's a bigger majority, sometimes smaller. In this election, what kind of a majority do you expect Hillary Clinton to get over Donald Trump? I say still we're going to see between seven. They usually is around seventy percent. Uh, Hillary, uh, although she will be more uh, accepted by the Israeli political system than Obama. And uh, still she has problems with uh, Mr. Netanyahu. Um, it's not going to be a honeymoon, and maybe some of the elder Jews of Florida will sense it, and then that's why then I'm, some of them are not going to go over the 70 percent. But maybe it's between 70 and 80. Maybe it will rise above 70 to closer to 80 uh, because of uh, the fear of Trump, even though, we must say, he tries to get the Jewish vote, especially Jewish uh, fi finances. He uh, also tries to get the ultra-Orthodox vote, the doesn't ultra, he? Uh, yeah. Is he? He has the support of the ultra-Orthodox community? <laughs> Again, I, from, I, when I ask my family, they, they're very hesitant. They all themselves are afraid of a candidate like uh, Trump, not only because of Israel, but also because he's it's something unknown, and Jews really want to vote for somebody they know. Well, yeah. let's come back to that. It's a very interesting comment you made about, about looking at Israel in order to decide how to vote. For, of the Jewish population, do most decide based on the candidates' policies about Israel or about local American social issues? It's more and more local, as we know already. But, how, but it depends. The old generation, especially survivors, uh, Holocaust survivors and others, definitely put uh, Israel on top of their uh, concerns. Uh, the young generation is different, and uh, we know that the support for the liberal vote among Jews, for the liberal uh, candidates, is getting stronger. Um, but the uh, Orthodox Jews that are more uh, um, uh, usually support, uh, vote according to Israel ticket, especially Orthodox, the book of modern Orthodox and so on. Even there, I feel that Trump is scaring them. And I think he, if he wants to get a, a, his candidacy going again, he has to control himself. The he donors, is. though, are very important. Some of the Jewish donors that do care a great deal about Israel. Aside from Sheldon Adelson, who has announced that he's supporting Trump, are most of the Jewish donors sticking with Hillary? Uh, probably. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you would say about Elsa, he knows gambling, so he should know, but he gambled also the last time uh, when he put his money on Romney. Um, yes, uh, 
probably, but as we know, that the, the, the Israeli, uh, the Jewish uh, um, uh, finances are going towards the more the democratic candidates. Again, we don't know exactly uh, how it's divided because all of it is down behind the scenes. So we don't know exactly. I, I just heard yesterday that they were trying to even to mobilize the Isra Israeli, citi Amer Israeli citizens with American passports and they're putting some... Uh, the local the Republican local, the leader is uh, trying, uh, trying to do that. To, it's ridiculous because uh, they, most of the Jews who live here, you have to, then you have to associate them with which state and, you know, if, it, if you really come down to uh, how many of them can be identified with uh, Florida, Ohio or Pennsylvania. The numbers are very they're, tiny. They're very tiny. Yeah, it would be silly. <laughs> Uh, to try to put emphasis on this vote, um, it's a, it's a, it's something to be said about the American system. I mean, that uh, candidate like uh, Trump made it, and uh, and then he he's following in, in the national elections, which is uh, amazing. Um, the, the discrepancy between the two, the, the, between these two processes. And Dr. the processes are important because usually one of the tests why somebody can be a good president is because he's going through this one year campaign which prepares him uh, to rule. And um, here we have another phenomenon which uh, maybe we should talk about, and that is that. Uh, if we compare the two, still Hillary, I'm not talking about her personality, but about her past, she's very well prepared to be a president. She has, she lived in the White House, she was influen uh, she was influencing uh, uh, Bill Clinton, and she then was a senator, a secretary of state, so she, she is prepared, compared to the, to Trump, who doesn't have any political past, and if he, without having a political past, and then also now uh, failing in, 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 in this campaign, it's something to be said, which I think will be studied by American political scientists for many years to come. Dr. Shmuel Sandler, thank you so much for being with us at ILTV. Thank you. An annual report card on anti-Israel activities at U.S. colleges has just been released, showing some positive developments but also several disturbing new trends. Let's start with the good news. According to the Israel on Campus Coalition assessment, the actual number of BDS campaigns on American campuses dropped by 25%. That means this past academic year is the first time we're seeing a net decline in boycott, divestment, and sanctions initiatives since 2012. There was also a 28% decrease in the number of universities hosting Israeli apartheid weeks because there was a 12% decline in anti-Israel events. Just as supporters of the Jewish state stepped up counteractivities by 3.5%, there was a 2 to 1 margin in favor of the pro-Israel camp. This means there was an overall 150% jump in visible support for Israel. Now for the downside. Perhaps due to new laws making Israeli boycotts illegal in an increasing number of states, the country's haters and anti-Semites are shifting their tactics. Now they're focused on strengthening identification with Palestinian solidarity. This means more demonstrations such as die-ins and disruptive activism, including heckling or walking out on any lectures or guest speakers perceived as being pro-Israel, such as visiting dignitaries from Jerusalem. And even though it's taken a hit, the boycott movement isn't dead by any means. We're now seeing efforts to ramp up its influence in the Midwest, with Chicago now emerging as a major hub for the anti-Israel campaign. Until now, California has been a hotbed of BDS activity, and in fact, the former president of the UCLA Graduate Students Association just transferred to New York University because of BDS. Third-year law student Milan Chatterjee, who is Hindu, says he was harassed and bullied on the Los Angeles campus last year after he refused to compromise the grad group's neutrality by funding a project sponsored by activists associated with the hate campaign against Israel. 
Israel has a deep appreciation for American cinema and theater, and now it looks like that appreciation is going to go even deeper. An Israeli theater company is recreating the famous play and film The Producers here in Tel Aviv. And even though the star Jewish director Mel Brooks won't be directing it, we're pretty sure there's a lot to look forward to. Joining us in the studio today is actor Howard Schechter, who will be starring in the play. Thanks so much for coming in. Thank you for having me. So to begin, tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you end up becoming an actor here in Israel? Well, I was an actor for many, many years on the New York stage. And then I was uh, convinced to come out to Hollywood, where I did mostly episodic films. But I tried to stay on the stage as much as possible. And then when I made Aliyah about six years ago, uh, the first thing that they said to me, the Sal Klita, said, oh, you're an, you're an artist, you're an actor. Uh, we give grants to actors. So I saw that, the, uh, that Israel was really interested in the, in the arts and bringing you know, these things into people's lives, and enhancing people's lives through the arts. And they encouraged me. They gave me a grant. They gave me a scholarship. So I ended up going back to work as an actor. I never dreamt that they would want an English-speaking actor here in Israel, but it turns out that uh, there was quite a demand. So I did a play, and... Uh, that ended up going to Jerusalem, and um, then I got an, an agent through that, and the agent got me some work on TV, a very, very wonderful TV show. And uh, from that, I ended up going to another agent and uh, doing film and, you know, a lot of commercials and things like that. And, uh, but I always want to work on the stage, so when I was given the opportunity to uh, do Max Bialystok and the producers, I go. couldn't resist. So, you know, that's what's so beautiful about Israel, that there are so many opportunities for here, here for especially people that are coming from abroad and may not be able to find uh, work in their home countries. Now, you're starring in this musical, The Producers. Give us a taste of the plot for those of our viewers who don't really know much about this story. Well, The Producers is about a down-and-out producer, a producer who was a tremendous talent and uh, uh, a protege of the great, great acting teachers and uh, he was kind of an impresario and he made you know very very big hits on Broadway and now he's down on his luck uh, so his accountant comes to do the books of his last flop and uh, he suggests to him that uh, you could make more money with a flop than with a hit so uh, Max immediately begins to look for the worst play in the world that will <laughs> close on page four and uh, they find the play and uh, it's called uh, Springtime for Hitler. It's a kind of a love letter to uh, Adolf Hitler, Yimach So uh, he figures this will, this will be a, a big flop. And of course, it becomes a huge hit. And they raise all kinds of money, hoping that uh, you know, it'll be a flop. But now they have to pay the investors back. So that, I don't want to give it away. I don't want to spoil it. But uh, basically, it's, uh, it's, it's about it's about wanting to be back on top and doing whatever it is that you have to do to, uh, to do it. And uh, again, I don't want to give away the ending, but uh, anybody yeah. who's interested in the original movie, which was uh, starring Absolutely. Zero Mostel and Gene Wilder in 1968. Gene Wilder, exactly. I want to right. talk about that. Actor Gene Wilder, as we all know, sadly passed away last week. And he played a lead role in the first uh, film version of The Producers. How has his death affected you know, your process in preparing for this show and the process of your fellow cast members, if at all? Well, I think that uh, the spirit of Gene Wilder inspires us all. Uh, the fact that he passed away while we're working on it just reinforces the fact that uh, he was such a brilliant talent and his work in the movie was, you know, launched his career and um, he brought so much laughter and so much joy to so many people and he was such an inspired comedian so I think his soul brings us nothing but inspiration and I think that that's permeating the uh, the rehearsals now when we think about him yeah well I mean it's a timely thing that you're able to you know uh, launch the show in the uh, you know the year that he passed away because it's it's kind of like a memory of him you know so you know how how will the fact that this show is now being recreated in Israel uh, with a partially Israeli cast, because I imagine there are Israelis on board as well, influence the show? I mean, this isn't the United States. We're in Israel, so there's probably some differences in how you guys are preparing. Well, 
I don't really think it makes that much of a difference. The cast is enormously talented. And many of the people in the cast, although they're Israeli, speak perfect English. So you really wouldn't know whether they were Israeli or they were American. And um, uh, some of them are uh, from America. You know, they're Ola, who have come here and um, they're working very hard. And it's a truly dedicated and talented group of people. And uh, I really don't think that that has anything to, uh, to do with the effect that it has on us. But the interesting thing is that here's a play about one of the worst chapters in human history and about one of the greatest monsters that ever lived. And Mel Brooks has developed this way of turning it into laughter and delight. And being in Israel is even more inspiring because here we have so many people who are either the survivors or the children of the survivors or the grandchildren of survivors. And to have this play bring so much laughter and joy, it really is, it's a tremendous inspiration. And uh, it's, a, it's really a, a great opportunity and a, a great privilege to be able to bring this to uh, the Israeli public, and it's the first time it's been done in English. It has been done in Hebrew, I understand, but it's never been done in English. So once again, it's, uh, it's the, the turning of our morning into dancing and, and joy. And Absolutely. I think that's, that's really, that's one of the most beautiful things about it. Well, and you know, it's so interesting because we spoke about this before, but there are so many influential Jews who essentially created Hollywood and the producers is kind of uh, a glance into that, right? Mel Brooks directed it, he was Jewish. Uh, Gene Wilder is Jewish, he's a top actor and obviously the, the characters themselves are Jewish, right? So yes. uh, it must be very unique to be in the Jewish state you know, portraying. Uh, it, it really is, but don't speak about Mel in the past tense because Mel is still yeah. alive. Right, and of course he's he is. Ninety years old. I know that's that it, is true. That he is was true. just given a medal of honor from the president of the United States. So we're going to have to bring him over here to watch your guys' portrayal. You never know. Show, yeah. You know, anything can happen in Israel, and I wouldn't be surprised, Mel, if you showed up and we had lunch together. I mean, there yes. you go. Maybe he could direct uh, the show for one night. That would be well, very interesting. Well, I don't to watch. know if Israel Lutnik would like that, but uh, there you go. There anything you go. can happen in Israel, and that. That's, that, that's really the truth. So as you know, an American actor, is there any difference between performing here in Israel versus performing in the United States? Well, performing is performing, no matter where you're doing it. But the, um, uh, the dynamic here in Israel is, um, is much different than the dynamic in America. And here, everything is done on a shoestring. Uh, financially for the most part so sure. we don't have the great big tables of food that we have in the limousines picking us up in the morning and one thing and another however uh, there's a kind of a, a an adventure to it that doesn't exist in American uh, television specifically and on the stage uh, you know again performing is performing there isn't as much money involved and there isn't as much prestige involved but there is a, a spirit of Kadima, just let's do it, you know, and, and, and going by the seat of your pants. And just the Israeli culture is embodied in it, in the sense that we take so many chances in Israel. And we're just not afraid to try things. And I think as a result of that, so many of the, 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 the product of Israel is now finding its way into Hollywood. Um, yeah, we're seeing that with scripts, you know, TV uh, shows here that are being recreated in the U.S. Homeland is an example of that. Homeland is the greatest ex uh, is the greatest example of it. But um, uh, many of the shows, the show that I worked on for uh, Yes TV called New York, was also, uh, I think, uh, delivered to uh, America, one of the networks, and um, because the creativity, it's it's something that. Um, um, it's, it, 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 it's hard to put into words, but there's a freshness about it and a dynamism about it that I didn't experience that much in America. But here I see that uh, these ideas are, uh, they're allowed to develop in such a way that the American wants it, the American public wants it because it's, it's so unique and it really is uh, exciting. Yeah, well, you really can't try anything over here. That's what they say. 
So everybody, the producers will go on tour starting on October 19th, and you can catch the first show in Jerusalem. For more information, check out the information below. All right, thank you so much for coming in. I'm thank going to you. go and check out one of the shows myself. Please, please come backstage afterwards and have a bottle of champagne with us. Absolutely. <laughs> Tel Aviv and Jerusalem are only about 40 miles apart, but the two Israeli cities often feel like two different countries, especially since it can take almost two hours to travel between them. Now, that unnecessarily long commute is about to change since Israel is set to finish building a high-speed rail line that promises to slash the travel time between both cities down to just 30 minutes. The $2 billion project will take another 18 months to complete after more than a decade of planning. In order to build the track for the high-speed rail line, construction workers have had to dig tunnels through mountains and build bridges over deep valleys so that the commute from the Mediterranean Sea to the Jerusalem mountains is as quick as possible. We will continue to build these tunnels, this railway to connect Jerusalem to Tel Aviv and to make our capital, historical capital, Stronger. There's already a train between Jerusalem and the coast, but it's a slow scenic route that takes over an hour and a half. The train was built during the Ottoman Empire and improved by the French and the British. And while less Israelis use it for daily transportation purposes, there are still around 7,500 people riding the railway every day. Israeli Transportation Minister Yisrael Katz believes a new and faster train will boost Jerusalem's economy by encouraging more people from the coast to open businesses in the city and even move to the ancient capital. This line is going to connect Jerusalem to Tel Aviv uh, by half an hour with one uh, station stopping in uh, Ben Gurion Airport and uh, it will change uh, a lot of things in Jerusalem because people will live in Jerusalem and walk in Tel Aviv and also the opposite will live in Tel Aviv and walk in Jerusalem more population in Jerusalem and more business in Jerusalem and this is uh, our main aim here to connect Jerusalem to the rest of the country of Israel. The double-decker train will be able to hold around 1,700 passengers and will travel at 160 kilometers per hour. And if you're interested in visiting historical Jerusalem from Tel Aviv, there will be four departures every hour between the two cities. The speedy railway is estimated to be able to serve 50,000 commuters a day and around 10 million a year, and promises to be a godsend for Israeli government employees who are forced to sit in traffic on a daily basis as they commute from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. So I guess it's time to get ready to say goodbye to back-to-back -to -back traffic jams and to say hello to more visits to Jerusalem, because travel is about to get a whole lot easier in Israel. Imagine walking over the pristine marble floors in the Second Temple 2,000 years ago. That might have seemed impossible last week, but now you can actually see the majestic mosaic for yourself. More than 600 fragments of the vibrant floor tiles that once decorated the temple have just been found in Jerusalem. Many clearly date back to King Herod's reign in the first century before the Common Era, when he carried out extensive renovations and grandly expanded the Jewish holy site to its current size. The remnants of the magnificent marble floors were discovered after sifting through mounds of rubble that were piled up by the Islamic Waqf Authority that controls the area. Back in the late 1990s, the Muslim custodians were heavily criticized by antiquities experts for using bulldozers at the ancient compound to create a subterranean mosque. Everything left over was just dumped to the side, but a major project was launched in 2004 by Israeli archaeologists who meticulously sorted through the debris. Since that time, countless priceless artifacts have been retrieved by hundreds of volunteers. So if you want something new on your own bucket list, come to Jerusalem and take part in the Temple Mount Sifting Project. You never know what treasure you might unearth. 
And now for our Hebrew word of the day. They say you're a wise person if you know how to enjoy the show offered by the world. So today's word is chataga, which means show in Hebrew. Israel may be a small country, but it's filled with incredible theaters and cinemas. And you don't have to be a Hebrew speaker to take part in the art. There are tons of atzagot or shows in international languages from English to Russian. Just look at ILTV. Our Hatzaga Israel Daily is shot right here in Tel Aviv, but it's in English. After all, Hatzaga Chayevet Leimashech, or the show must go on, even in Israel, no matter what language it's in. Let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. The weekend is just around the corner. Thursday should be sunny with a high of 88 degrees. The temperature should go up to 90 by Friday, so you might want to prepare to head to the beach. All right, everybody, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.76 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.tv, and don't forget to check out our next update at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Thanks for watching, and see you tonight.